all right, let's go on to liver disease. This is what I originally planned for you. And then, you know, I got this, this notion that I, you know, maybe I should go over this stuff again for people. You know, maybe I should put it in such a compact form that you can insist your doctor, your friends, your relatives, your well-meaning in-laws will sit down and watch this segment. And what will take you 40 minutes to go through this? And say, well, what do you think? Anyway, you kind of caught me in that kind of mood. I gave a little bit of this presentation last night on the our five o'clock session, which I hope some of you join us. It's five o'clock every Sunday night, Pacific time. Uh, Heather, Mary, and I would get on for an hour. No gimmicks, no charge. Just answer your questions for an hour. Anyway, I gave this presentation last night. All right, so let's go on to the liver problem. You have access to the science. Don't overlook it. Go to the National Library of Medicine, pubmed.org, P-U-B-M-E-D.org, the National Library of Medicine, and put in the citation. And then look for the DOI number. Okay, the digital object identifier number, and then come back to the Sci-Hub website and put it right in there and say open. And then the article will appear right there in front of your eyes. But don't bother copying it in that form. You have to hit the save part, and then it saves as a PDF you can work with. It's all, it's, it's all yours. Like I can't imagine you wouldn't come prepared to your doctor's office when it's paramount to something as important as, as your life. Anyway, let's get on. Let's talk about liver disease. All right. Uh, the most common problem we have with the liver or the biliary system is gallbladder disease. 30% of Americans over the age of 60 have gallbladder disease and there's an acronym that uh, all medical students learn. Uh, let's see, let me get back here. Uh, all medical students learn, and uh, that is who's most likely to have gallbladder disease. And the acronym is the six Fs. I always taught it as four Fs, but it's up to six now. The six Fs, female, fair, fat, fertile, 40, and flatulent. <laughs> then you're looking at a chance of having gallbladder disease probably up to 50%. But most of these people, they never had any pain. They never had any trouble from them. They just had these silent gallstones, asymptomatic gallstones, and maybe a little inflammation of the gallbladder. That's, that's right. Uh, typical symptoms, uh, you get pain in the right upper quadrant that radiates to the scapula. You know, the, what is this, clavicle? No, not the clavicle. Scapula, that, that bone back there in the, in the back. It radiates in that area most of the time up to the right shoulder blade. It, it's the gallbladders on the right side. It's, you know, that's where the liver sits. And, uh, you know, pain lasts for 15 minutes to several hours. And it's really, really severe. It'll cause you to pay attention to what's going on. And the way you diagnose uh, gallstones is by doing an ultrasound, which you know, it doesn't cost you any radiation. It's just a, a matter of looking. But I have to warn you, if you look, you find. And if you find, you might be obligated to treat. So be careful what you ask for. Because if they're going to look in your abdomen, both an ultrasound, 30% of the time, half the time, they'll find gallstones. They'll find something that will trouble you and may be encouraged to do something about, which is to have those gallstones removed, which I'm going to encourage you not to do. The risk of developing serious problems when you have gallbladder disease is rare, 1% to 2% of the people. And uh, half a million gallbladders are removed every year in the United States. It's a five billion dollar year business. Cost between three and six thousand dollars of surgery. Another interesting thing from my career is that when we first started taking out gallbladders, we would do a nine inch incision under the right rib cage, and I'd get on one retractor and pull in one direction. Another student get in another direct retractor and pull in another direction. And then the surgeon would get down there with the scissors and locate the locate the common bile duct. Make sure you didn't cut the common bile duct. Oh man, you make sure you got just the duct that went to the gallbladder because you kill the patient if you cut the wrong duct. Anyway, we we take out the gallbladder and the gallstones and throw it in the wastebasket. Go on. 
Well, then we had laparoscopy discovered where you didn't make a nine inch incision. You just made a couple little pokes. You know, you're up and walking around within hours. And they just went through with a couple of tubes and they took the gallbladder out that way. And boy, oh boy, the incidence of gallbladder surgery went up, doubled overnight. Why? Because patients said, well, it ain't no big deal. It isn't a big deal as it was before. And doctors found another way to make a quick buck. Ninety percent of gallstones are made of cholesterol. Where does cholesterol come from? Cholesterol is only from animals. But no plant or plant food contains significant amounts of cholesterol to ever trouble anybody. Animals, and we're animal. We are an animal, and so therefore, we make cholesterol. We make all the cholesterol we need. It's made from plant sterols. Plant, plant sterols are converted into cholesterol. And then cholesterol is converted into vitamin D, sex hormones, and bile acids. Okay, so uh, the way you get extra cholesterol, more than you possibly could need or make, is you eat animals. When you eat animals, we run into a problem. And that problem is, is your liver only has a limited capacity to excrete cholesterol. And that capacity matches your uh, amount you produce. It can get rid of about 500 milligrams of cholesterol a day through the bile, into the bowel, and out into the toilet. But that's it, about 500 milligrams a day. Say you eat an extra 500 milligrams. What's it going to do with the extra 500 milligrams? Your liver can't get rid of it. Now, if you were a dog or cat, that would be no problem because Dogs and cats as omnivores and carnivores, all they do is they just crank up their liver metabolism. They excrete all that cholesterol. You never, you never cause gallstones or atherosclerosis or cholesterol deposits ever in these animals because their livers are different. They can they're designed to handle the cholesterol. So, so what do you conclude? What, what's your, what is your conclusion? I know, I know, I know. You say we were born with the wrong kind of liver. Or you could say, well, you shouldn't eat like a dog and a cat. That's the other conclusion. Anyway, gallstones are made of cholesterol. Every doctor knows that uh, you get gallstones from super saturation of the bile with cholesterol. It becomes overconcentrated, super saturated with cholesterol and it precipitates into cholesterol gallstones. That's the way you get them. All right. But as I mentioned, you don't know they're asymptomatic in most people. All right. So let's see. Supersaturated bile, I covered that. Oh, one of the ways you can supersaturate your bile with cholesterol and have more gallstones is to switch from an animal fat diet to a vegetable fat diet. In other words, if you switch from, you know, fat from pigs and cows to fat from corn, okay, you're going to have more gallbladder disease. These polyunsaturated fats are toxic. Toxic. You know, in our last hour's discussion, you want to sludge the blood, you add vegetable oil. It sludges the blood more severely and longer than animal fat does. You want to promote cancer, add vegetable oil to the, to the subject's diet. You'll really get cancer growing. These vegetable oils are toxic. Anyway, vegetarians have far fewer incidents of gallbladder diseases than typical America does. So you eat the cholesterol, your liver has a limited capacity. That's the picture over there you're looking at. There's a limited capacity to get rid of the cholesterol. And so it ends up to being deposited all over the body, including the gallstones. All right, so how do we know this is a disease being the Western diet? Well, we can look at populations that have recently changed their diet. Like for example, the Taha Amari uh, Native Americans. They're called Taha Amari Indians, but I know that's not the right terminology these days. Uh, Taha Mari Native Indians, there was a group called the uh, Pimas, which ended up in reservations outside of uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Tucson, Arizona, right around that area, Arizona. They, li they lived on a, a reservation and, and what happened is the water supply of that reservation was cut off. And so the federal government who felt like they couldn't leave these 
poor Native Americans to starve to death because they couldn't grow crops anymore. They give them free food. So they gave them the American diet. And so you have a population of Pimas living in uh, Arizona who have a higher incidence of American diseases than any other population I can think of right now. Well, I, I could probably talk about the Inuit Eskimo or, or the Native Americans from the East Coast, but let's just pick, pick on the Pimians for Pima Indians for a while. All right, uh, Pima Indians. 73% of the women over the age of 25 are found to have gallstones. However, a genetic identical counterpart are the Tahamari Indians who live in the Copper Canyon in northwestern Mexico in the Copper Canyon. These are the Tahamari Indians. They stayed on their native diet, which happened to be changed by the by, by the uh, but by, by the things that happened on the reservation, uh, they stayed with the corn and rice and beans. The Tahamaris did. And the Pimas didn't. They ate the Western diet provided to them a la courtesy of the U.S. government. Anyway, you see what happened to the, uh, to the incidence of gallbladder disease. This is the age the first chart. See how it increases up to 80% of them have gallbladder disease. Well, look at what happened to the cholesterol levels when they switched the Tahamari to the Pima Indians diet. In other words, they switched them from beans and corn and squash to pork chops. You see the dramatic increase in cholesterol, which goes along with the increase in gallbladder disease. This is a population of people where somewhere around 70% of them are obese and have diabetes. Well, you can say, well, you know, they're genetically less strong. I don't know how you'd say it would be nice. No, that's not, they haven't had time to be naturally selected as people eating the Western diet have. You get the weak ones gone. So yeah, there's some natural selection that went on. Anyway, to do this experiment, they fed them 900 milligrams of cholesterol and their cholesterol levels increased from 113 to 147 milligrams per deciliter when you fed that richer diet of Tom Marines. All right, so one other thing I got to talk to you about gallbladder disease is that um, anytime you lose weight, you increase your chances of having gallbladder attacks. So if you have your teeth wired together, you go through a bariatric surgery. In fact, with bariatric surgery like gastric bypass, 30% of the people who want to go to surgery within a year or a year and a half have gallbladder problems. Low carb diets, same thing. Anything that causes weight loss. Uh, will increase the chances of you having gallstones discovered and having gallbladder attacks. There's only one way I believe you can lose weight and not have this happen. And that's if you lose the weight by eating a starch-based diet with fruits and vegetables. Now, I've seen, I've seen a few, but not many in my career, of people who have developed gallbladder problems shortly after they changed the diet. Certainly not the number expected, like 30% that you see after, after uh, bariatric surgery. You know, we're talking about probably four people in 12,000. Why? Because you're, you're feeding a diet that contains no cholesterol. I mean, you, you, you're setting up everything to heal. So I wouldn't let this increased risk of having a gallbladder or gallstones, gallbladder attack, increased risk of having this happen to you if you lose weight. You just got to lose weight by the right means. You'd be fine. All right. Uh, the problem with having your gallbladder removed is you've removed a necessary organ. The gallbladder has a purpose, just like the appendix does. And so does every other a part of the human body. They have purposes. And the purpose of the gallbladder is to store bile acids between meals. The liver makes bile acid. And it also filters a whole bunch of stuff out of the bloodstream and the tissues. And uh, it makes these bile acids, which are for the purpose of digesting fat, vegetable fat, animal fat. So the more fat you eat, the more bile acids you make. These bile acids are made continuously throughout 40, 24 hours, okay? They're made all day long, but they're not needed except when you eat a fatty meal. So between meals, 
So you only eat two, three, four times a day. Between meals, the bile has to go someplace. And where it goes is into this storage sac called the gallbladder. And then what happens when you eat the sphincter that uh, connects the cystic duct with the small intestine called Odi, his name is Odi, that's the sphincter's name. He relaxes and the gallbladder contracts and you squirt this bile on your fatty meal. Well, what happens when you don't have a place for storing between meals? You get a constant drip of bile acids into your intestine. All day long, you have no place to store it. And plus, you don't have the components that neutralize bile acids, which are plant parts. You know, plant fibers will grab a hold of bile acids and deactivate them. So what you have is you have this constant drip of bile acids throughout your small intestine and into your large intestine, which is the reason why people post gallbladder disease have diarrhea. It's because the bile acids are so irritating, they give horrible diarrhea. It's also the reason you have a higher risk of right-sided colon cancer. All right, right-sided colon cancer. You see the right side there? It's because if you have this drip, 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 drip of bile acids, which are irritating, all right, so you go on a low-fat diet, the diarrhea stops in basically every case. I have people who have 20, 20 watery stools a day. Within two a day and a half, they're gone. They they're, 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 are down to relatively formed stools a couple of times a day just by taking the fats and oils out of the diet. This was published, by the way, by Andreessen in the 1970s in the journal Gut. Not new. Ignored, but not new. All right. So anyway, uh, let's get into another situation that you may be confronted with, and that's finding gallstones that are asymptomatic. Asymptomatic gallstones. In other words, they don't cause any symptoms at all. It's just there. Uh, here, for example, if you get a chest X-ray or you know some abdominal salt ultrasound, salt, see those gallstones? You never knew they had those. They're never bothering you. They're asymptomatic, but they're there. What are you going to do about it? Well, you might be encouraged to have them surgically removed. All right. But when studies are done, taking two courses of action, one is to immediately treat the gallstones with surgery when you find them. The other is to wait until you have a problem. And at most, only 20% of people have problems, but at least 80% that never were bothered by their gallstones. If you wait until you have problems, then you have the surgery done. When you look at the outcome, you find the outcome is just as good or better by waiting. Immediate therapy results in more death and harm than waiting. Don't treat your gallstones. Leave them alone. I remember one of the most enjoyable things in my anatomy class in medical school was when we found on one of our cadavers gallstones. Everybody had to come over and see him. Look, gallstones. Mabel has gallstones. Give the medical students a little entertainment. Leave your gallstones in place. All right. Uh, real popular these days, uh, fatty infiltration of the liver. That's what we used to call it. It's called uh, uh, hepatic steatosis, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. In other words, if you're a non-drinker and your liver gets sick, inflamed, how do you tell that? Well, you might have some pain over the liver area, which is in the right upper side. Uh, you might get some blood tests done and find elevation of liver enzymes. That's another way to do it. You could also do an ultrasound. Certain types of uh, x-ray procedures might show it. What you see is fat infiltrating the liver. Now, what do you think causes the liver to become infiltrated with fat? How about what causes your buttocks to become infiltrated with fat? How about your abdomen? How about your thighs? How about your skin? From eating a high fat diet, folks. Yeah. They, they say this inflammation can result in such severe inflammation it causes cirrhosis of the liver. They reverse this easily. Change your diet. But don't fall into the recommendations to switch to good fats. This whole idea of 
but don't eat bad fats, but eat good fats is toxic. And I've told you these good fats, they increase the risk of cancer, the fat you use, the fat you wear, they sludge the blood seriously, and you know, cause more gallstones. Don't buy into the good fat idea. You'll anyway, here, here's, here's your randomized trial using good fats, and they showed no benefit. Good fats don't help when it comes to fatty infiltration of the liver. You just are infiltrated with good fats. The fat you eat the fat you wear, and there's nothing more attractive about wearing animal fat in your liver, your thighs, your buttocks, or abdomen than it would be to wear vegetable fat. They're both disgusting, folks. They're both deadly. Non-fat is where you want to go. Low fat. There's no such thing as non-fat. A little bit of fat in all the foods. All that you'll ever need. All right. Liver patients. And I, again, as a medical doctor, a board-certified internist, I've had a chance to take care of people with failing livers. Most of them alcoholics. And uh, what you have to deal with is you have to deal with people, getting these people healthy as you can. Very lost, 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 lost your share of the liver. By the way, the liver is the most regenerative organ in the body. It will just leave a little bit of a left and it tries to grow back. It has that ability. Even if you, you drank yourself half to death or you've eaten a fatty filtrating diet, the, it'll heal. Tremendous ability to heal that liver is. But you got to treat it properly. And what you have to feed it is a diet that at least taxes the liver. And that's a low fat, and I just told you why, and a low protein diet. Because some of the initial metabolism of protein, you know, the stuff they sell you in meat and chicken and beef and protein supplement, the, the, the initial stop from the gut is the liver. And the liver's got to break down this protein into what we call blood urea nitrogen or BUN. You'll find it on your lab tests, BUN. And when you eat the Western diet, your BUNs are elevated. And if it becomes high enough, the BUN, you go into a coma. And if you lower the protein intake in the diet by getting the high protein foods out of the diet, feed into starch-based diet, maybe add a little bit of table sugar to it. These people in hepatic coma, they wake up. And when you feed equal amounts of vegetable versus animal protein, they get better with the vegetable protein, not with the animal protein. It's different. There's the research. Look it up. All right, a couple other things that I'd like to talk to you about. One is uh, uh, another desti destination for the fat you eat and the fat you wear is a little fatty tumor. It's called lipomas. Here's what the lipoma looks like. You know, just the way, just the way some people uh, deposit fat in this particular architecture. And these fatty tumors, they go away. Ooh, how do you think you make them go away? Come on now, guess, folks. You lose the fat. How do you lose the fat? Well, you know, you could go into a prisoner of war camp, get your teeth, your teeth wire together. You go on a low carb diet. You can have, create malabsorption through bariatric surgery. Yeah, there are lots of ways. To, oh, there's only one way to lose weight and be healthy. Oh, what does we do? How do we lose weight and be healthy? Oh, we eat a diet that the healthy, trim people have always eaten. And that's a starch based diet. You know that. All right. Uh, another condition that you might be worried about is cellulite. They've got special formulas and supplements and exercises and so on to take care of cellulite. Cellulite's just the way fat is stored in certain parts of the body, like the buttocks and thigh. The architecture of your fatty tissues is, uh, is, uh, is dominated by fibrous cords that are between the skin and the underlying connective tissue. And these cords are fibrous and they won't, they won't stretch. And as you fill the fatty tissue with fat, what happens is, is parts of the fat that are adjacent to the cords, they expand into this lumpy mattress that you're wearing on your buttocks and thighs. That's cellulite. How do you get rid of cellulite? Same treatment. Okay, okay. Another condition you might be concerned about is the fat you eat, the fat you wear. Acne. Acne does not occur in populations of people who eat 
a starch-based diet. That doesn't happen. Kids go through their teenage years uh, without oily skin, without pimples, without scars, et cetera. They just change. You know, you got the pimples, you got the grease on your skin. It takes about a month to get them to calm down. Uh, this is a research paper I ran across when I was looking for all the stuff that was done in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. When they used low-fat diets, starch-based diets, as opposed to a bunch of drugs, thinking that they would get you well. Some of you have cholesterol deposits in your skin and in your tendons. In the eye, they're called xanthelasma. And in your tendons, they're called xanthelomas. What do you do about it? Well, you look up the Journal of the Clinical Nutrition, 1952, volume one, page 52. And how do you do that? You go to the National Library of Medicine, you look up this particular reference and you find the DOI number, and then you go to Sci-Hub and you plug it in and there's the paper for you. They disappear when you eat a low fat, healthy, non-cholesterol diet. Oh yeah, you have lots of surgeons that will operate on them for you. Sure. All right, so that's probably more than I wanted to tell you today, Chef AJ. Remember, remember, you're not helpless. The information is available for you and your family. You know, do as much work as you would do before buying a new car or a new refrigerator. You know, you put days and weeks into the study before you buy the right one. Look it up. Read it. Challenge the recommenders. Doctor, are you telling me the whole story? You'll have some fun. I always do. All right, Jeff, AJ, we're done here, probably. Nice. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Uh, well, do you want to you know, stop, stop screen share? You can keep it up if you like, but I have some questions. Oh, yeah, I want you to notice that you were kind enough to say is that every Sunday night, Pacific time, five o'clock, all over the world, and we have listeners all over the world, Mary and I and Heather get on for an hour of discussion, and we talk about things that are important. They usually let me go for a few minutes and do a monologue, and then we answer all your questions free, no gimmicks. We're going to encourage you to come to the 12-day program. What do you expect? That's the best way for you to get better. Let us take care of you. You know, what's your health worth, huh? You know, you're going to buy a wardrobe that costs more than it costs you to come to the 12-day program. You might as well just buy a new wardrobe once. I bet some of you have cloths and stuff with a bunch of different sizes. You don't have to do that anymore once you learn a starch-based diet. The full potential of your body and your mind is expressed when it's properly nourished. And it's nourished by the diet that 99.9999% of the people who ever walked this earth have consumed. These are starch-based diets like rice in Asia and corn in Central America and Mexico, and potatoes in South America. And guess what? Guess what you eat in the bread basket of the world? You think it's called the pork chop basket of the world? No, it's called the bread basket of the world because that's what you're supposed to be eating is bread and corn and potatoes and rice. That should be 90% of your diet. And for most of us, it's got to be 100% because that little temptation just drives us back into into some very unhealthy ways. So it's best to do it 100%. But you don't have to. You get what you put into it. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop this whole thing here. I've got this army I'm trying to build, AJ, you know. I'm trying to build this whole army to help me change the world by just, to, just releasing the truth. And, and ask you to insist that you're told the truth I know how you feel. You know, your doctors are intimidating. You walk into a doctor's office, it's you know, their staff, their room, their instruments, they're in control. You don't know how to, you don't know how to get, you know, half, half of the discussion going in your direction. You got to prepare, you got to do some work, you've got to do the research. You know, you, you have to go in with the attitude that you're part of this conversation too. Anyway. Uh, there are lots of things you can do to become a good consumer. Right now, you're not. 
Right now, they're just walking all over the top of you. Great. Fire Wait, them. Well, you know, that's, what I, that's my attitude. Fire them. Get rid of them. There are lots of doctors out there. There are a dime a dozen. And, and pretty soon, if we get people healthy, they'll be, they'll be um, 12000 per dime. We have them driving taxi cabs, as far as I'm concerned. Except, let me tell you, there's some, there's some medical treatments that are crucial. I mean, you, you don't get a stake stuck in your heart and leave it there. You know, the intervention could save your life. So, you know, take advantage of things that are worthwhile. But if you have chronic illness, you're chronically overweight, you're chronically sick, they're not helping you. Start looking other places. It's the food. Ready for a few liver-related questions, Dr. McDougall? I'm ready. Great, thank you. The first one is from Kathy. And Kathy, and, and maybe you can mention if the 12-day program would be suitable for a condition that she has. And she is a longtime vegan. She says, can you please ask Dr. McDougall if fibrosis can be improved? And if so, how I have stage three. Yeah, you know, fibrosis means scar. Okay, so this is dead tissue. It's never going to come back. But if it's in the liver, I told you the liver has a tremendous regenerative capacity. So, you, you know, you could just end up with a tiny bit of liver left, functioning cells, and it will regrow. But the scar tissue is never going to go away. And if you keep doing the things that gave you the scar tissue, you're going to continue to lay down more scar tissue. What causes the inflammation in your liver? Probably it's an autoimmune disease. Uh, the, the body's attacking the, the, the liver. And the reason it's attacking the liver is the body's confused. And the reason it's confused is because you're eating livers. You're eating foreign livers. Uh, AJ, you know what, what, they, what do they call foreign livers? What, is, what do they call it? I don't know. I don't know what they call foreign livers. It's a meat. What, 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 are, for, what are livers? It's a liver called in a, a pate. Oh, a foie gras? Foie gras is a. You're eating livers from ducks and cows and pigs, and your body gets confused because it says, oh, oh, this is foreign. So it makes antibodies to cow and pig livers. But you've got a liver, too, that's pretty similar. And so it gets confused because of the other unhealthy things you've got from the Western diet. It starts attacking yourself. It's autoimmune disease. The body attacks itself. So you can stop this inflammation, I believe. And you do it by eating strictly a starch-based diet. You know, that's what you do. And uh, you should get better. But you gotta, you really got to take this serious. When it comes to autoimmune diseases, you can't just have a little bit. It's like uh, being allergic to penicillin and going into the dentist's office and getting a little shot of penicillin. You end up a little dead. You know, it just takes a little bit of these offending foods to get you in trouble. But remember, a little bit, like, like a, you know, a, a drop of food may contain like, you know, 50 million cells. That's a lot in a little bit. So you're gonna get in trouble. You've gotta be careful. You even have to read the ingredients in your packages or better yet, just get them in the original packages. They're called potatoes <laughs> and sweet potato. Nice. Here's a, a question about gallbladder. And this is from uh, Crystal. I had my gallbladder removed some time ago and food goes right through me. What can I do to help with that? And other people are saying, it's like, if you have your gallbladder out, are you basically screwed? Uh, is this a diarrhea she has after? What was this diarrhea that you said? Well, she's saying it goes right through her. So I, I well, guess let's, that's- Let's call that diarrhea. Yeah. Okay, you go on a low fat diet. The low fat diet, remember bile acids are made as a consequence of the fat you eat. So if you eat low fat, you make few bile acids, all right? You don't have a storage sac anymore. So these bile acids go from the liver directly into the small intestine, into the large intestine. You've got a constant flow of bile acids in the large intestine. So just by eating a low fat diet, which happens to have plant substances that complex bile acids and you deactivate them, 
the diarrhea goes away. Andreessen published this in the early 70s in the journal Gut. Look it up. Uh, he took people who had uh, uh, a tremendous problem with diarrhea. They had 20 watery stools a day. And he put them on a low-fat diet. And within 72 hours, most of them were having form stools, two or three a day, down from 20 watery stools a day. Okay, so I have people who have special things come up in their life and maybe don't have full control of their diet under circumstances like meetings or or trips or flying on airplanes and they're scared to death. They're gonna have diarrhea sitting in first class on the airplane. It'd be a big deal, wouldn't it? So what I do is I give them a bile acid sequestering agent, which your doctor prescribes, non-toxic bile acid sequestering agent. They're called cholestid and questran. And what they do, we used to use them to treat cholesterol. Because remember I told you that uh, bile acids are made from cholesterol. So if you suck the bile acids out of the system, you suck the cholesterol out of the tissues. It's a good treatment. Now, of course, we have statins. We don't have to get into that, but it's money. Anyway, uh, these bile acid sequestering agents like Questran or Cholestid, I have them take them before the uh, impending event, you know, the flight, the meeting, the vacation, and it stops, it stops the diarrhea. It's for the reasons I told you. It, it works extremely effectively. But the side effect listed on these bile acid sequestering agents is constipation. So you'll be able to fix it. Just get your doctor to write the prescription for you for Questran or cholesterol. Your doctor will do it. It is no strain at all to do that. Great, thank you. This is from, don't know who it's from, but the question is, if someone has autoimmune hepatitis, at what AST, ALT liver enzyme would you recommend medications? The levels are decreasing on a mostly raw whole food plant-based diet, but they're still very high. Well, I don't quite understand the question, but if you're monitoring your liver function tests, which is what they're doing, and they're still elevated, well, you know, I'd still try to improve the diet. I, th I think, in, you know, if you have any question about whether you can get well, this is the, these are the stages of treatment that I ask you to go through. They're described in my May 2014 newsletter. And you can work this out. It costs you nothing. No adverse effects. Totally under your control is you first start with the McDougall diet, which is uh, a diet based on starch with the addition of fruits and vegetables. You then go on to a gluten-free approach. And I usually combine the two. I start people out who have rheumatoid arthritis, et cetera, on the basic McDougall diet without wheat, barley, and rye. And then what I do is I have them go on to the elimination diet, which is the least likely foods to cause that kind of reaction. And that's in my May 2014 newsletter. If you're not better after all this effort and you've sincerely done it, then the last step, the last thing you can do that I think you should try before you give up is to go see Alan Goldhammer at True North. That's the ultimate, the elimination diet. That's the ultimate low cholesterol, low fat. All you get is water. If you don't get better on just water, then it's probably not the food. But that goes to the, you know, very inexpensive, very safe way of doing things. You know, in most cases, unless you're bleeding to death, it's, it's better to wait and think about it. It's better to go in well prepared as to know what you're going to do and why. Because you have to live with the consequences of your decisions. Your doctor doesn't have to live with them. You have to live with the, you know, the absence of a colon or, or the absence of a breast or the inability to ejaculate because you had your prostate removed. You got to live with this, not your doctor. I mean, good grief. If I, you know, really, I'm 76 years old. If I was told I had prostate cancer, and by the way, by biopsy in a man my age, 76 years old, eating the Western diet, by biopsy, random biopsy, there's over a 90% chance that you're gonna find cells in my prostate, if I were to eat the Western diet, that indicate I have prostate cancer. But it's really not a prostate cancer that will ever kill you. To transfer into the kind of cancer that escapes the prostate 
and moves to your brain and your liver and your lungs, et cetera, you got to introduce the Western diet. And, and then it goes from a, 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 a rather benign situation to something that could and will kill you. So it's never too late to stop eating that. You know, even, 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 even cancers undergo regression. Well, even people who have cancer all over their body, they've been shown to go through spontaneous regression. How often? Oh, let's see. 22% of the time. I, I, didn't, I, just, I just said over a period of six years, 22% of the breast cancers that are developing disappear spontaneously. Challenge your doctor with that statement and let me prove it to be true. See, so if you're busily looking for problems, you're going to find them. This is a study done on mammograms. They set it up. They, they did interval mammograms uh, six years apart. And they took a big group of women, divided them into women who got mammograms done every year or two, compared to women who got them never, except during the study. And what you suspect is that women who are getting every one or two years, uh, getting mammograms done and having the tumors taken out, you would expect the number of tumors to be the same in both groups, but you don't find that. What you find is those who were busily looking for the cancers, 22% of the cancers disappeared, went through spontaneous regression. You were cured. <laughs> they don't talk about that much, do they? But well, it's money. It's the food. You know, someday I'm just going to do a recording, AJ. I'm just going to do a recording. You can play it over and over again. I'm just going to sit here and go, it's the food. <laughs> so, it's the food. Oh, that doctor, oh, he, has, he just had like two statements he made over and over again. Oh, well. That's funny. That'll be the answer to every question from now on. So here's a question from Erin, and she wants to know if CBD gummies are toxic to the liver. I don't know that. I doubt it, but I don't know that. I'd have to look it up. You know how to look it up? Go to the National Library of Medicine, www.pubmed.org. Look it up and then go to a Sci-Hub and Get the paper and read it and take it to your doctor. Come on, you guys, help me. Oh, I don't want you to believe me. I really don't. I want you to understand me. If you don't understand me, then I don't understand my subject. You know, that's my problem. I've got to make myself understandable. But you've got to do half the work. You've got to take the, the knowledge that I've given you and the resources I've provided for you, and you have to become knowledgeable. You have to save yourself and your spouses, and your children, your parents. Unless you want to come to the 12-day program, then I'll save them for you. <laughs> That's one of the things I do, AJ, is I, you've probably known this of me, to get involved with patients and their other doctors and make their other doctors explain what they're saying to the patient. Have you ever known me to do that, AJ? No. Okay. You never heard about me getting involved with people who have terrible trouble and me going to the doctor. Oh, yeah, office. absolutely. Oh, sorry, I misheard the question. Absolutely. You argue, argue with their private doctor. In you their sure do. That's what you do. That's what you do for your patients. Absolutely. I do that for my patients. My patients are, are special. And I don't let them be abused. You know, any doctor, and I, believe me, I, I, I can't, you got to run the risk of losing the doctor, though. You know, I had a fellow about uh, eight months ago who uh, followed our diet, so to speak, and had an episode of chest pain, so to speak, and got into a traditional hospital in Los Angeles. And the doctor insisted that they, he was going to die if he didn't submit to the surgery. I said, show me the studies. I said, this is what the patient has. Show me the research. Just show me a study that shows that you're going to prolong this survival by doing the recommended heart surgery. One study, I just go for one study. 
He couldn't do it. But what he eventually ended up doing was kicking the patient out of the hospital, which I thought was the ultimate in, in not being a doctor. I mean, your job is to take care of these people. And they're having lots of problems and lots of difficult decisions to make. And to not offer them emotional and mental support is just a complete failure in your, your responsibilities as a physician. These are your patients. You have a duty. You have a duty. And I'd be glad to discuss any of these subjects with you. On Chef AJ show, if you have any question about what I'm saying, bring in your experts. I'll just do something that probably they haven't been involved with very often. I'll, I'll bring in the science. I'm not going to bring in yesterday's golf score or how the stock market is doing. Market, stock market is, is doing. I don't know that. I just I have no interest in either one of those subjects, but I can tell you what the science says. I love the science. Wow. Okay, That's Chef AJ, let's quit. All right, Dr. McDougall, that would be great. Thank you so much. So you're taking July off. We all are. And uh, you'll be back hopefully in August with another great show. Yeah, I, I have July off, don't I? Well, you, have of, no, you don't have it off in your life. You, you're running a 12-day program. It's just that in July, we're going to be, um, I'm going to be in Mexico. There's when, no, it's going to be no, no, no McDougall Monday, right? Right. No, well, it will. It just won't be airing live that day. So we're, we're going to see you again in August. So you, you have any idea what you might want to what, what you haven't talked about yet? Uh, I'll probably go back on diabetes again. You know, just like today, I went on heart disease and cancer just as a review to show you that you're being lied to. Uh, I will go through the diabetic pills and treatments to show you again if you're being lied to. You can't call it anything else. You're just plain and simple being lied to. And I can prove it. You know, in, in, in a, what do they say? I can prove it in a minute. Just give me a device. A phone will do. Okay. Or, or my computer. Just give me a device and I'll go to the National Library of Medicine. And then I'll go to Sci-Hub. And I'll put those papers on your desk. And I will show you that you need to rethink things. You know, maybe you've been lied to too. I think that's the problem is, is uh, the, the lies are so extensive. Of course, there's a tremendous amount of money from the food and drug companies behind it and the device companies. The lies are so pervasive that my colleagues don't know the difference. They take the attitude, well, everybody's doing it. It's got to be right. Everybody's doing it. And I know that the chances of me being sued or not depend upon whether I'm practicing the community standard of practice. If I kill you, just like the guy or gal down the street, I'm okay. I don't get sued. But if I do something different, like feed you potatoes and broccoli to get well, even though you get well, that, that scares a lot of my colleagues is to do the right thing because they're afraid of being criticized or being sued. And they, they should be, unless they prepare themselves. Uh, I may be uh, speaking, you know, too aggressively, too egotistically right now, but, you know, I, I really look forward to the challenge. Uh, I may be wrong. I may end up losing my career by being challenging because it's not, not just always who's right, it's who's got the most money. But I'm willing to take that risk. And the reason I'm willing to take that risk is because I'm a doctor. Well, we appreciate you, Dr. McDougall. And people are asking if one time Mary will come back again because they also enjoy seeing her. Well, that's what we'll do. So let's show, do the show. Well, in the meantime, every Sunday night, five o'clock Pacific time on YouTube, Mary's there with me. We'll, we'll get things answered. That's great. So you have a nice summer. Uh, we'll have one, we'll just, just one month off. off, one month off. I'll, I'll, I'll still be doing the show, but, you know, there been, because we started doing regular programming in January with 28 guests, all the people waiting for a one slot have not been able to come on. So we're going to get them in in July, and then August, we'll go back to our regular programming. Well, good. In the meantime, in the meantime, uh, you know, I, I wish you a good summer, and I wish you that you get the health and appearances you deserve because you deserve 
to look good, feel good, and function well. You, you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I told you this, but when you were on with Dr. Grimm last week, people really liked that format of you and another doctor having a conversation. So think about doing that on my channel. If there's other doctors you'd like to converse with, people really oh. thought you were a great interviewer and it was really engaging, you know, going back and forth with someone like that. And I was polite. Yes, you were. <laughs> if professional. You know, no. you, you can plan on anybody out there that wants to take another point of view. As long as you give me the same courtesy of being polite and professional, I'd be glad to talk any of these subjects over with you. Why? Because it's for the patient's benefit. And besides that, if I'm wrong, I'd like to be I'd like to be corrected. I don't need to I don't need to exaggerate. You know, the truth is is stranger than fiction. You know how it goes. So uh, any anytime you find you know you're you go and you share this stuff with your private doctor or friend or in law or whatever. And they say, oh, well, Dr. McDougall's a bunch of, hmm. well, you say, well, would you like to tell him that? Would you like, would you like, in a polite way, would you like to tell him that I can get you a position on Chef AJ's show? And he can discuss heart disease and colon cancer and breast cancer and a lot of things with you you think you're so darn smart about. But you better prepare yourself. You know, this is one of the problems I've run into with, uh, with these kinds of conversations is uh, my colleagues in a challenging manner will come in unprepared. And they really don't expect that I won't do that. I'll come in prepared. And uh, they're in for an interesting hour if they didn't get prepared. Even if they spent a lifetime becoming an expert in cardiology and oncology, I will be prepared. And I, hopefully I'm in a position to admit that I'm, when I'm wrong. Great. Hopefully. Well, great. Thanks, Dr. McDougall. All right. All right. Talk to you later, Jeff AJ Group. Thank you. Summer. Thank you. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. when Elizabeth Manser will be celebrating her 73rd birthday, making some incredible recipes. Take care.